looking at smart grid technologies and thinking about the needs and around the globe of energy and efficient electrical distribution causes us to think and consider about our greater global energy challenge. We know that our finite energy sources are depleting more rapidly than ever before. And we know we need a new energy source that can scale globally for all of our growing population needs. We also know that that source has to impact our world in an environmentally benign way. So the next grand challenge we want to explore together is trying to discover a source that will solve all of those needs. The National Academy chose to look at providing energy from fusion. Now, fusion is a very elusive source for us. In fact, so elusive, it's been um, scientists have been trying to scale this technology for more than 50 years to the scale that we need globally. But to give us all a little bit of an education on where we're at currently in the world, the state of fusion, I'm excited to bring to the stage now Dr. Stefano Concesi, director of our physics segment, as well as Michael Cerna, senior, senior software engineer at National Instruments. Dr. Concesi. Buongiorno, bella signora. Buongiorno. Stefano, we will need to speak English for this particular segment That's for myself right. and the audience, please. Now, Stefano, could you please educate a few of us here? We need a little one -on 101 course to, dis to distinguish the difference between fusion and fission. Sure, my pleasure. So, both reactions are nuclear reactions because they happen inside the nucleus of the atom. Let's start with the fission. If we take a very heavy element, heavier than iron, and we heat with a slow energy neutron, we split the atom and we get some radiation, neutrons, and two unstable lighter elements. This is a very consolidated energy uh, technology. It's more than 50 years that we are leveraging the fission to generate electrical power. However, there are some challenges because there is not so much uh, uranium available for this and the two have lighter elements are very, very radioactive, so it's very difficult to handle, to store, and there is always the fear of uh, nuclear proliferation. However, there is an advantage that doesn't generate any greenhouse gas. So let's look also the other nuclear reaction, the fusion. It's, it's basically the other way around. We take two very light elements, like deuterium and tritium, and at the right temperature and pressure, we smash one against the other one, and we get a third heavier element, helium, one neutron, and also here a tremendous quantity of heat, energy. And there is some advantages. There is no any unstable radioactive material, so there is no waste, so there is no uh, fear of uh, nuclear proliferation, but this is not a very consolidated technology. It's more than 50 years that we've been studying that. And to give you an, a feeling of the energy that is inside the nucleus, in this bottle of water or in this small stone, there is more energy than a family can use in an entire year. And the last consideration is that the light elements are very available in this, in this world, and fusion is a very natural process. It's happening every given moment in the star and in our sun. So Shelley, from some perspective, I could say that fusion energy is really the base of life on this planet. So you described how fusion is a natural process. It's already happening in nature today. You also explained what's needed. When you said water, it's, it's salt water, it's any type of, of water. So obviously, we know that's a very, very plentiful resource that we have available. So with such a great description of what this can do for us and what's required for it, is fusion happening today? The answer is yes, but we still don't get energy from that. So let me explain how it works. So first of all, there are plenty of nuclear fusion reactors around the world, in Brazil, East and West Coast and the States, across all Europe, in Far East Asia and in India. But all these are really experimental machines we still don't generate energy from them. All these scientists and engineers in these laboratories have been using National Instrument product for diagnostic system, for interlock system, for safety system, and mainly for control system. And I and these laboratories have been working together for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or called ITER, a huge monster that is going to be built under construction in South France, in Cadarache. But our cooperation with, with these scientists uh, that is 
a long story, but we have been working very, very close with a senior scientists at the Max Planck Plasma Physics Institute in Garching near Munich. Mike, can you update it about this cooperation? The name of the experimental physicist is Dr. Louis Giannoni. Uh, and Dr. Giannoni shared with us this uh, short uh, video of a, what they call plasma discharge. So it's an eight second plasma dis discharge experiment. We might loop it. It's important to know from seconds one through seven, uh, the, the plasma has reached a constant temperature and density, but the uh, fusion neutron rate is, is quite low uh, because the plasma temperature is, is only a few, a few million degrees. A few million degrees. A few million degrees. So sad. Yeah, it, it looks like to me the, the summer in Texas, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, um, good one. How much matter we use for base? At I understand it's just a few milligrams. So Shelley, yes, we have fusion. Awesome. We have fusion with few milligrams and few million, uh, million degrees C. But Mike, you talk about plasma. What plasma is? Plasma is ionized gas, so think of it as a, a cloud of charged particles. Uh, the, the main challenge for plasma-based uh, fusion is to uh, contain the plasma at extremely high temperatures, much higher than the sun, over 100 million degrees, in fact. Uh, but so you can't, uh, um, well, obviously can't touch it, but you can't confine it using some solid objects, so you use its uh, responsiveness to electromagnetic fields to contain it. So the, imagine a big magnetic bottle if you want to contain the plasma, and that's important to, to reach a efficient fusion power. Dr. Giannoni was already using our data acquisition um, products to acquire his magnetic sensor data, but he needed help with his, uh, to make his plasma shape control faster using LabVIEW real-time on multi-core targets. Why the plasma shape is important? Well, the tokamak is uh, an elaborate uh, plasma control machine. And so the controller needs to know the plasma position and shape in order to know how to, uh, to confine it. Because once, if it touches the wall, it shows over. So, no show over. Yeah. so basically it makes sense to, to control the, the fusion reaction inside this big donut that is the tokamak, I need to know the position of the plasma, so the shape of the plasma. How we can really do that? Well, the plasma and the electromagnetic field within the tokamak uh, reach an equilibrium state um, as described uh, by this uh, uh, grad shafranoff equation derived in the, in the 50s and the 60s. Mike, what was the name of the equation again? The grad shafranoff equation. One of my personal favorites. <laughs> so, this equation governs an electromagnetic field in the equilibrium conditions. If you, basically, if you can measure the magnetic field outside the tokamak and solve for this equation, then you know the electromagnetic field within the tokamak, and thus the plasma shape uh, is known. Th this is, look to me, a two-dimensional nonlinear partial differential equation. Of course, it's a lot of hard words, Stefano. I come from the Enrico Fermi School. I can manage that. But how computer can manage this? Well, typically, uh, uh, they use supercomputer technology to study this equation, to learn from tens of thousands of simulated data sets at equilibrium, and uh, they basically design a, a massive matrix or lookup table. Uh, so in, in a loop, Dr. Giannoni was computing a matrix vector multiply, the matrix being the, the designed matrix, uh, and then uh, approximating the plasma shape uh, by approximating the equation. So let me recap. You have the donut, and we are get, get, taking all the information, tomography and data acquisition that are the orange uh, arrows. And these are going to the supercomputing that offline are populating a giant matrix. And this matrix is feeding the MIMO controller that control the plasma. That's is correct. this correct? That's right. Good job. Can we improve it? Well, uh, Louis had a dream. And that was to actually solve the grad shafranoff equation uh, in, in the real-time loop. So we started to work with us on a project to do just that. So we knew that we could use LabVIEW's uh, new um, high-performance analysis library and, and of course, its multi-core uh, capabilities uh, to, do, to do that. And we derived a, a few new algorithms um, to solve this in a real-time situation. So let me recap, because this is extremely cool. I have the tokamak. <laughs> 
I take all the tomography data. By the way, we love FPGA and FPGA, but this is another topic. I take all the data acquisition, again, with the Net Nationalism Data Acquisition Board, and I feed all this information in a machine, in a computer that is an off-the-shelf technology with multi-core, and there I'm, I'm running LabVIEW real-time in all the multi-core, in all the core of the computer, so in order to have real-time math that is feeding the system. So it's no more simulated, it's no more uh, offline, it's everything done online. Is this correct? That's right. Uh, and the I loop time, again, it's, it's dictated by the control, the control loop, which has to run in the order of 1,000 times a second. One millisecond. That's right, one millisecond. I have to say it to believe it. OK. <laughs> so here we're showing a 3D scene of the tokamak. And in, in the middle is, is our rendering of the, of the plasma itself, the plasma shape. Let's take a cross section. So what we want, want to do is, is basically make our measurements at the perimeter and solve for the equation over these, these field lines, and then know the, uh, the uh, plasma contour, and then thus its shape. So let's run the solver. This VI actually executes the grad chef runoff solver. Mike, are you using real data here or simulated data, or what are we looking at? Well, this data, um, actually, to, to validate the algorithm, the data uh, came from uh, Dr. Giannone uh, from his magnetic sensors. So there you go. So we're. So let me explain a little this okay. pretty nice chart. So you have the tokamak on your left. You have a section of the donut. We use, you can see all the electromagnetic field. And you want to optimize the position of the plasma inside the vessel, inside the donut. And on the right side, you have the real-time data calculated within, it's less than a millisecond. It looks to me almost 8 microseconds, 800 microseconds. And everything is calculated in real time. Those information are fed to the control loop, and so we can control the plasma in real time. That's exactly right. So let's bring this back into the scene so you get a better feel for, again, this equation now. We're superimposing its solution on the scene. So that's what it kind of looks like. And then uh, the controller then engages magnetic coils at the perimeter to, in effect, push back on the, uh, on the plasma and contain it. So this, this critical kind of technology, which is solving PDEs for complex math in the loop, uh, is definitely feasible. Awesome. So, Shelley. We are still not there. We are going to have the very first plasma useful for electrical power generation in 2019. So, good for your daughters. But the point is that this is an incredible leap forward to develop a technology, a commercial off the shelf technology that can resolve the plasma control that means to to have fu fusion and as a source of energy, reliable, green, and absolutely no polluting. And this technology, this real-time math, thanks to LabVIEW real-time and uh, the leverage the multi-core technologies, can really be used also for other applications, like for faster, better weather forecast, or to build active building that can react to earthquakes. And one day, who knows, mainly for our European friends that are freezing here, to have a better control of this room, temperature control. That would be awesome. Thank you, Stefano. Fantastic. Thank you for having us. Absolutely.